I came back to Derby to do my nursing training. And um, all my um, cousins and cousin brothers came back to town and um, they all um, signed up with the APB and had a um, job spraying insecticide or whatever the hell it was. I think um, it was really a toxic spray that killed all the um, vegetation. But not only that, you know, all our bush tucker and all our kangaroos, emus, goannas, they all got baited as well. And when I was a kid, you could spend hours down the river and you didn't have to look that hard for food. You could survive because there was that much food there. As I got older, there was nothing. And the things that were there, we didn't trust to eat because the first time we'd ever seen the Marawara or the Fitzroy River, rainbow coloured. It never in our history was like that. Never. Not even when we was in drought and famine, nothing. So it's all to do with the spraying program that my brothers and cousins worked on. Yeah. Um, what I what I don't like about it is that Aboriginal families that had survived and lived in the bush had nowhere to go. They all had to move into town and that's when, you know, no housing programs. We were all just chucked on reserves. Only quite, you know, few families were able to get proper housing. There was nothing, you know, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, nothing. Um, there was the Great Depression years that people survived through and they lived off the bush. You know, now, look at the um, CDP and the um, dole money that's there, it's not even enough to survive on, so they can't even go out bush and survive. And if they do go out there, you don't know if it's safe enough to eat the food. When I finished my training, um, but even through my nursing days, at various times a lot of the boys and women came in and we, I nursed them in the hospital. And you know, there was um, hardly any of them had diagnosis. Uh, a lot of them had kidney failure, a lot of them had really high blood pressure. And um, you know, you'd, you'd advise them, you know, you need to be doing it, getting another career. But in those days, there was nothing. There was no jobs and whatever jobs there was, it was already taken up. And it took people years to get jobs because the government never ever put in any big employment programs, you know. There was like main roads, that was all taken up. You know, there's only so many jobs that was going and people just couldn't um, survive. Um, nowadays when we go down out bush or down the river, things are starting to regenerate again, but you know, it's not the same as it used to be. The foliage is all gone, the big trees are gone, and the trees that are coming up now, when you cut them, you cut the stems of those things and you see the damage in those tree trunks, you know, it's, you don't want to use that for medicine. Yeah, we used to, when we used to go to the movies at the open, open air cinema, um, from the 60s, 70s, the stink from the APB yard as we walked past, there was that much fumes. We used to cross the road and walk down the other side of the road because it just smelled so bad. And um, the APB um, office uptown here, um, you had to walk around the corner to get onto Lock Street. So you pass this, we'd cut past the, um, between the shy and the swimming pool and get to the corner of Lock Street and where the APB yard was, right on that corner. We'd have to walk around that and get onto Lock Street to get down to the cinema. So we had to, we'd stay on this side of the road, get down past where Rowles was, and it's now the new um, fish and bait shop. We had to cross down that way, go past the old post office and then to the cinemas. Because the smell was that bad. So um, my husband's brother worked for the APB in that spraying program and we'd go and drop his lunches off, me and my husband. Um, and it was bad then, and on the, 
they'd be sitting on the drums, they'd have their open lunch boxes or open unwrapped food on the bloody thing. And we used to always say, look, this is poison. You guys shouldn't be eating here. You shouldn't be in this small shed. You know how bad that it's so toxic in here. We can't even stand in here. So we'd be outside or beeping the horn at the car because we couldn't walk in there and sit in there. It was that bad. Same as the shed they had um, at the airport. We used to drop lunches off there too. They'd be busy packing up to go out bush. And um, yeah, a lot of them would stop and think, but we couldn't walk in the shed. It was too bad. Even where we parked the car, we could still smell the fumes. It was worse than sitting out there when the plane's ready to take off and they've been refueled. You know, the, the smell from those drums was really bad. Um, there was, um, there was um, the senior medical officer and then there was about four or five different doctors that came and I can't recall their names offhand. But they stayed for about a month and they were just screening people. And I didn't know what they were screening for because they covered every medical um, problem that you could have, you know, um, ENT specialists, um, gastroenteritis and all, you know, gastroenterologist, um, bone specialist, um, even for renal and for heart disease. There was a cardiac, um, a, a surgeon. They came up and screened a lot of people, but we didn't actually know who they had um, earmarked or who was um, who were actually the one, the clients of the patients that they were screening for um, diseases relating to a um, 24T or 245T. So we didn't actually know. They were just screening people. And the other part about it is that it was also a disguise because at that time we was also screening people for Hansen's disease. So nobody actually knew which patients they were screening for the um, toxic spray or whether it was for Hansen's because everybody got screened. They took all the same um, specimens they'd tell them that, oh, you got a heart problem or you got a thing, we need to send you for tests and stuff like that. Or if they didn't want to go down south, they did the tests here. But nobody actually knew what they tested for. And I doubt if a lot of them patients actually knew themselves. Until it, like maybe for muscular dystrophy and things like that, you know, um, where their muscles get hard and and they can't move. That was an unexplained thing here in the Kimberleys because it never ever happened before. So that was one that was hushed up and maybe the client moved away for a bit, be closer to a bigger hospital for testing so they would have been transferred to Perth. There was a lot of women that lost a lot of babies and that was like unprecedented um, figures. So if you check between sev no, 1970 and 1987, that's when you'll get that high figures. And then they sort of dropped. But I reckon now because of the infant mortality rate, that would be up again. So like if, um, if, you, if your father was in contact with that spray, they get, they in contact with the family, they get their washing, they get, you know, the skin contact, it, because you absorb it in your skin and it doesn't show up to later years because it's sitting in your brain. So all those things that happen with the parents and the children, that thing could manifest or come to light years later when that child is an adult. You know, so it's, it doesn't show itself straight away. Maybe the rashes or burns that, and then they go away. But years later, it, it surfaces, you know, with the miscarriages, the blindness, the muscular dystrophy, the heart problems that, and deaths. So, you know, it's, it's a silent killer because the government has kept it silent. And all those patient records, I bet you, you can't get at them. You've got to wait, you know, till you go get it under Freedom of Information Act.
it all stays secret because even me, if I want to access my patient file, they say, oh, everything's on the MMEX. Anybody can look at their files, but there's other things that you can't look at and they're locked. I think that people have been fighting the fight for so long and the government has still, you know, still kept everything so secret. And I just don't think that's right. I think that the government should and should have been helping those families and people to get seen quickly and to, um, you know, get them help and support for those families early so that when they do, when those illnesses show up years later, at least they've, at least they've tried to um, catch it in the beginning. You know, there's a lot of things that would have been treatable, but because they've been left and nothing been done, it's, it's gotten so bad that they're all dying from it. You know, where's the help when they needed it at the time? You know, I, I just don't understand that part of it. I think that the government should unlock those secrets. I think that, that they should admit what, the, what they did wrong or what the state government did wrong and the agriculture department. I think that the families are owed something. I mean, you can't bring back our families, but you can, you know, you can apologise. You can try and make things right for them in some way, you know, and even if it is, even if it comes down to money, you know, we, I don't really want to talk about money, but look at all those families that had to bury their kids, you know. I just think it was a waste because um, because we didn't get to spend that time. <laughs>